real shadows in there, so not a bad investment. And then they made plans to have a 20 by 40 uh, cabin built. So by the time they show up in 1899, the, the house was pretty much, you know, it, it was real rustic to, to begin with. It was never that ornate. So most of this, the shell was there as, as well as the, the way the cottage would have been for the, for the remainder of the next three generations, really. There's not been a whole lot of additions, except what kitchen was added later on. But just a small 20 by 40, very rustic fireplace. Um, and that's Hemingway's first visit will be 1899 in September. So he's just barely, you know, two and a half, three months old at that time. We have the pictures of him there. It was cold. They're, they're all dressed in, in cold weather gear. But um, that was the first trip up. And you figure all said and done, uh, they had less than less than a thousand dollars in the in the cottage and the property. And on the second tour today, we were talking about somebody was asking me about wages and, and what is kind of that money equal. Well, when you figure them coming up out of uh, out of Chicago with the transit for eventually six kids, mom and dad, and sometimes they would bring a nurse or a nanny with them. But when you're thinking seven, eight people, uh, the railroad fare from uh, Chicago, uh, so Oak Park to Chicago, and then Chicago up on the boats, the boats land at Harbor Springs, and then you're gonna come around through Wequitonsing, Roaring Brook, Minocqua, all these different developments coming around into Bayview, and several stops, maybe there's a change here and there, uh, then downtown Petoskey, and then downtown Petoskey to the substation, which is 100 yards away. And then to Clarion, Michigan, just uh, south of, uh, of Petoskey, Michigan, just east of here. And then from there they would change, and then they'll get back over on a dummy train here, which pulls out right onto the water. And when you think of the fare, it was probably 17 to $25 a person per season. So you start comparing that to the 900 bucks that they paid for the whole cottage. That's a, that's a pretty, good, uh, pretty good value up here on the, wa on the, on the water. So. So that's, that's the transit up here. Uh, Hemingway's again, first time is up here in 1899. He'll spend at least a portion of every summer up until the time he's married. Uh, the summers that he's not here the entire year would have been that first year in 99, and then 1917 when he graduates high school and goes to Kansas City. 1918, he's here just prior to going to, uh, to Europe for, the, for World War I. And then the last summer that he's not here for the entire summer is that summer of 21 when he just comes up in September again to get married. So we start with the September, we end with the September. <laughs> Other than that, he's here for the whole summer. And uh, the early years especially, they're, they're here at the lake. They're, they're not going into town a whole lot. They're, most of their time is here. It's a, it's a journey to get here. And it's an all day journey as we read in the story, 10 Indians to get into town. Uh, here or Charlotteville, it was it was a it was a long long process. Of course, you could take the train, but then you still have those stops. And stuff. And it's still it's still a journey either way. Whether it's walking was probably the fastest way. That's how heavy they got around up here, is, and then hopping trains. So, do you want to show us where the train came in, and then uh, kind of where they would get on the tourist to get to Winterburn? Yeah. All right, let's go. We're gonna follow you. Nowadays, kids always say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Yeah. Their trip up here was sometimes 24 hours. <laughs> it's funny, these, you couldn't give these condos away. Uh, 10 years ago, we could not <laughs> give these condos away. And now, I think that was at like 350. I think they're all, they've all sold them up into the millions now. <laughs> I know. Uh, well, you got road in your backyard. Yeah. Now the boaters party in front of you. But the 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 run of the the the, the renaissance that the village has gone through. Uh, you know this was this was a thriving community during the Hemingway's time, and then not so much for 40 years until uh, the current uh, owners of the Walloon Lake Inn and the Barrelback Restaurant and the Hotel Walloon. I mean, they've done an amazing job revitalizing this whole this whole area. And that, that helps all the small businesses here. And we've just broken ground on a new development, which will be so continuing to add on to what we're doing here in Walloon Lake. Talk a little bit about the wedding party that we're going to be doing in September. There's not smell o vision. Oh, 
left my purse and my keys and everything in my car. Oops. It's not so glamorous now, but uh, so based on the pictures that I have looking looking this direction, just kind of from that perspective, uh, this really has to be about where the train station was, um, and it was kind of just set back maybe a couple hundred yards this direction, and then the train would come out here and pretty much pulled out right onto the lake somewhere, it, it was probably just about where the hotel, the hotel is, because uh, on the curvature here you have the, you know, you're coming around to, to the Walloon Lake Inn, and back then, the new Walloon Hotel was over there, which was a huge standing, uh, probably like five-story structure over there. So that's the so the train must have been just about right here. And the train would have pulled right out onto the onto the onto the lake. Uh, so there was an old hotel there. there over on that side, yeah, it was a huge one. And there's a couple okay. more small ones this way. But the new Walloon Hotel, uh, that was the, the big one was over here, and that was the primary one. Probably. Yeah, they had yeah. huge diving boards and jumping slides cool. and just. Uh, just well, that makes sense. It was thriving by the 1900s. You've got tons of people here swimming. Oh my God, if you're sinking suits and they're all solid. Yeah. <laughs> the Hemingway's were the same thing. You see a picture of Grace in that. It's like a, like a, like a How do blanket. People swim in this <laughs> but yeah, the train must have pulled right out here and it pulled out onto the water and then it just, you know, just back up. There's obviously no round table here. Yeah. And then the tourist boat would have been waiting here, which was about a, I think you probably put 50 people on there. Uh, but the, the rumor is, is it was famous for sinking once in a while. It was a very top heavy uh, boat. Mm -hmm. And so after that 24 hours of travel and transferring all those big stacks of luggage like you see in those pictures from, from tourism back in those days, well, then the Hemingway family still has to get to their cottage. And then everybody used to always say, well, that, that boat would take them to their dock. Well, who put the dock in? Mm -hmm. you know, no, that's going to... No, it's going to drop him at what uh, Ernie Mainland, uh, Ernest Hemingway's nephew, who's recently uh, uh, passed on, unfortunately, uh, in the cottage at Windermere, it shows all the water taxi stops. And one of them would have been right where Resort Pike Road is now, where Resort Pike ends. And that's about mm, it's 10 cottages down or so from where the Hemingway family cottage is. So they were taking all that stuff from there. Now that's got to be transferred to the cottage. Uh, and well, the, the Baker family probably helped them. I, I imagine you know, they, they knew they were coming up here. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't see Grace carrying it's a, a big wagon. Yeah, they probably came up with a wagon or something to help. Yeah. And then as the story goes, you know, they had they, they packed for the summer. So all the dry goods, a lot of that stuff came up here with them. All the clothing. You're not just going to go shopping. Uh, there was some some uh, shopping here in later years, but you really needed to know a farmer. And then for the rest of your supplies, uh, there was, uh, there was uh, Montgomery Ward. They put their order in uh, almost weekly mm -hmm. for food and come the following week. Yeah. Usually yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cool. story goes, the minute they got up here, after all that travel, you know, you're dressed in your suit, but they would, they would love the skinny dip. So yeah. they, all those rules from Oak Park were out the window. <laughs> and, uh, and at least one or tw once or twice in summer. But usually that first that first swim would a lot of times be a, uh, an inaugural jump into the into Walloon and tristening there naked. And and, uh, and then, as the story goes too, the kids just would start opening up every trunk they could get their hands on to look for the ginger snaps. Ah. I'm sure not making it back into my grave. Jim remembers Jim Sanford, who's Marceline's oldest son, the oldest grandson, out of the out of the you know from Grace and Clarence. He remembers visiting his grandmother, and uh, she didn't know how to make toast. Oh wow! He had to make his own toast. <laughs> oh my goodness! And then there's a story of her making a cake up here. It was not a great cake. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I don't know a child that doesn't like a cake, but yeah, she literally there's no there's no mention of her ever cooking. Yeah, Clarence um, cooked. But yeah, she had all these progressive kitchens. Mm -hmm. So Windermere itself was was had a small small kitchen on the inside of the house at first. And then I think 1906, right around that period, that's when it's extended the big breezeways put on. And then the kitchen's added, and that's the heat we heat out of the cottage, which worked really well. And then of course the house in, in, uh, in uh, Oak Park and Kenilworth, that had a really progressive kitchen over time. But this isn't a book, it's not a book. Yeah, they had the Clarence did most of the cooking. Or Clarence or Ed did it, yeah. And then they had a, a, at least at least one or two um, servants or maids or nurses, they call them. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's being built here? Thank you.
So this is going to be a new multi-use facility. It will have retail and then condos. No, not a Hemingway thing, but it, it, they just broke ground on this in the last uh, week or so. And who are the owners here? I do not know who the owners are, but there is a rendition on the building uh, sign down there. So it'll be condos and other things. Wow. Retail, yep. This is big time for this little village. And then the village is also um, where we parked at Melrose Township Park. Uh, expanded the parking lot back there because parking is a premium in this village um, during the summer season. So, and then of course we've had this redevelopment. You kind of mentioned how things went away, but like at one point, not too long ago, this was a ghost town. Absolutely. And then you have uh, folks like uh, Jonathan Borish who came in and developed Barrelback Restaurant above the old marina and built the. Uh, Hotel Walloon and then purchased the Walloon Lake Inn and so now you have this revitalization of this historic downtown all right yeah and this is a certain amount of this has to be a labor of love for, 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 for Mr. Boris because if you or I in my opinion were to buy this piece of property here and put a hotel that costs so much to build and I think there's what, 36 rooms in there? 38, yeah. 38 rooms. We're going to have a hard time making money. It's, 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 it's got to be a little bit of a labor of love. Well, he was born here. So, you know, he has this personal vested interest in, uh, in having this town thrive. What a nice legacy to be the man who saved Yeah, Paul. right? All right, where would you like to go next? Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing, too, to think about, though, is, like, in that, in that time, um, the pictures that I have of downtown Walloon, I mean, this is pretty much developed down through here. You have houses and rooming houses mm -hmm. and two smaller uh, hotels that were built out there, and it was uh, it was a winter. Uh, I mean, these were families. This wasn't just a summer resort. This was, um, this was a small little village. Yeah. yeah. Little I mean, village. they made boats here. They made, you know, they had um, uh, grocery stores and all kinds of things. They, they were bowling alleys here. Yeah. Three bowling alleys. And you said, how did the Hemingway family find it? You think a family connection? Yeah, so, I mean, but you had people, there was a lot of marketing. So even by the time they came here, like Mary Jane Dore, a friend of mine, it was very rustic up here at the time, but they were already holding major conventions for like insurance companies up here. You had 12, 15, 18 of these little micro resorts around the, around the lake. Uh, several of them came from old lumberjack hotels that had been converted when they saw people start to come up here. And uh, the story is, is that uh, Grace Hemingway's cousin had, had some connection to the area, and they got either way they got a tip to come up here and and um, and loved it. Like, how do you not love Lake yeah. Walloon, especially yeah. when there's when there's hardly any houses up here at that time? Yeah, because I'm thinking they had to have heard from somebody because I was just thinking Chicago's a long way from here. So I mean, there's so many places in between you could have found somewhere home. Yep. But they just must have heard that this was bad. And it's still part of that marketing campaign we talked about today where uh, the GR and I railroads, well, both railroads, were really marketing the Midwest. And they really concentrated on Chicago just because it's right on the water, very easy just to get up there on the steamships. Yeah. Um, but that's Kansas City, that's St. Louis, that's right. that's uh, Indianapolis, uh, as far far east as New Jersey, like we mentioned earlier, too. Um, so uh, if this, is, this is free air conditioning, this is fresh water. Even like the Belvedere Club in Chicago, yeah. those are all Chicago people. Chicago. And like the woman on the tour earlier today, Roaring Brook was uh, was a lot of people from Lansing in Indianapolis. Yeah, so like, yeah. and it happened in my family too. Um, and it, I know it happens now with a couple families that, I, that I'm familiar with here. Like, what do you do when you're on the vacation? You bring your friends up. Well, with my grandparents, they took their, their friends to their cottage and uh, they bought the lots right next door. So you get these communities that, right. that are just mm -hmm. like at home, almost maybe other. too close. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's cool. I know families that have five or six properties on this lake just mm -hmm. because maybe they married summer people also. Mm -hmm. Now you've got two cottages plus your own. And so. Did Walloon Lake advertise itself in a certain way or have a slogan or was it just more undiscovered? And I haven't seen the marketing stuff like we've seen for Petoskey and Charlevoix and Harbor Springs, but yeah. um, was it word of mouth? Was there a quieter campaign possibly? But I, I think it was just more... I saw some earlier newspaper ads that were more like rooms for rent, mm -hmm. 
you know, cottages for rent and stuff like that, but they were all tiny little ads. It wasn't like, you know, buying a full page ad in the St. Louis newspaper or the Chicago newspaper. And that's, and that's what the GRNI did. They had a massive campaign to bring people up. In fact, that, that was the whole purpose, was it to, uh, like the Grand Hotel we talked about, I don't know if it's the first tour or the second tour this morning, but the Grand Hotel was not profitable probably to like 1950s. What was profitable was the two railroad, okay. railway stations, you know, the two railroads that, that, that built, had it built. That's bringing people up and back all the time. They're making their money. That's how they're making their money. Uh, and then, of course, eventually the hotels became profitable too. Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Should we walk down to Circle Park real quick? All right. Or at least across from Circle Park. So I want to talk. Actually, let's stop at Talcott and then we'll go to Circle Park. And, you know, it could have been. You know, this far, like to me, it's just like it's like this area. Right here. <laughs> right. And they didn't want to go to traditional hotels, right? They want to have something more private. Yeah, and that's that, that's the fun thing that my friend uh, George Colburn talks about is the fact that up here we have what's called Bliss Fest, this, this big kind of, it's kind of, kind of hippies, if you want to still use that word, but you know, the, the avant garde, the sedge, the fringe. But for, for Clarence and Grace, now Clarence loved the outdoors. Yeah, but for Grace, wearing all those ornate clothes and coming from the comforts of Oak Park, this was this was like like rustic camping. This sense, you know, probably probably at least as good as rustic camping. They didn't have indoor plumbing till well well into the twenties at least. So that's it's outdoor like you know lavatories mm -hmm. and, and you had pumps, of course, you had pumps and stuff like that. So they had fresh water, but. Um, just the thought of embracing those petticoats and going out there. Yeah. And if you go to Windermere Cottage today, the, the outhouse is still there with a sign that says, Ernest Hemingway sat here. <laughs> <laughs> Each summer, that was one of his duties, was to dig into the laboratory around. So here we have the Talcott Center, and this the Wallen Lake's original name was Bear Lake, and then it was Talcott with an O, T-O-L-C-O-T-T, then it became Talcott as it's spelled here. And then in 1900, it became Walloon Lake. On September 3rd, which is the 100th anniversary of the Hemingway wedding to Hadley in Horton Bay, we will be having a recreation wedding a reception here at Talcott. It'll be a fundraiser dinner for the Michigan Hemingway Society. I think tickets are 125 a person or 200 per couple. We have the newlyweds will be guest of honors and they will be brought in via Model T, which is how they tra uh, were transported from their reception at Pinehurst to Sumner Road. Both places we'll see today. And then they went off to Windermere. We will be having a menu very similar to what we think might have been served at the wedding reception, which includes uh, the Dilworth famous chicken, fried chicken, tomato pudding, tomato pudding. Uh, Palmer rolls, um, and a variety of other things that were provided to us by the Dilworth family. These were family recipes. So if Hemingway didn't have them at his wedding, he would have at least had them uh, at some point when he was at, at Pinehurst in Shangri-La. Probably a thousand times. Uh, yes. The village was, uh, uh, Horton Bay became famous for their chicken dinners. Uh, it was called the Premier Resort Town on Lake Charlevoix. Uh, just these three little yeah, rustic, four little... Yeah. yeah, and people would travel over. It was like fine dining. Yeah. To go to dinner, like we would come up here to the Walloon Lake Inn now. <laughs> Bless you. And, and they had competing chicken dinner, dinner recipes and competing tomato pudding recipes. Well, because Red Foxen had Red Foxen yep. had their own. So um, the Dilworth, some of those descendants of the Dilworth family will be guests of honor that night, as will the descendants of, of the Hemingways. So I believe that um, Ken Mainland will be invited and Jim and Marion Sanford hopefully will join us. And so we will have that celebration here. We'll kick it off at six o'clock on Friday, September 3rd. And uh, the guests will, the, the newlyweds will arrive at about 6.30. We will toast them with a beautiful champagne toast, which probably didn't happen at the actual wedding reception because it was during prohibition and Grace and Clarence probably would not allowed it. Um, and then we'll have dinner. We will have an auction with some very special Hemingway themed items up uh, for the auction. And uh, then the evening will end out here with a cocktail and cigar lounge out on the patio um, to end the evening. I so the evening wasn't ending. Well, I'm probably going to walk home. <laughs>
because at the end of that night but uh, we'll put tickets on sale here in early june for that event for anybody who wants to join in those festivities so and then uh we have well 200 150 to 200 people it's going to depend on covid depending on how many capacity we can have hopefully we're past all of it and if that's the case we can have about 225 to 250 people so and then um we'll, we won't actually cross the road but um one extra stop here at the circle park um during the course of the summer, a couple other things are going to take place. One, we're going to have a um, birthday celebration on July 21st here downtown, where right between the antique shop and the Sweet Tooth, we will be dedicating a little free library focused in on Hemingway. All of the titles will be by, about Hemingway, or his family, or topics of interest to him. So fly fishing, uh, northern Michigan. Things even like the Paris wife, any of the stories that were about him, even fictional, um, will be there. And the Friends of the Cricket Tree Library will be staffing and taking care of that for us. And then on Saturday, uh, we will be unveiling some historic and art pieces in the park here in Circle Park. And if you've seen any of the historical signs that we saw today in downtown Petoskey, um, the village will be actually installing one sign dedicated to the early trains of Walloon, the early boats, the early resorts, and then the early history of the community. And then there'll also be one that morning dedicated uh, for Hemingway. And then the Michigan Hemingway Society for several years now has been installing these little brass placards. You might see them in downtown Petoskey or now in Kalkaska. Uh, Horton Bay, we'll see several of those today. Um, we will be unveiling one of those here in Walloon Lake during that ceremony on that Saturday with a variety of other family-friendly activities. We'll have some fly fishing uh, demos. Uh, we anticipate having <coughs> people dressed as Hemingway at various stages of his life. So we have a, what, a three- or four-year-old we'll Hemingway? A five-year-old. And then we'll have a teenage Hemingway. We'll have a post-war Hemingway and a Papa Hemingway. So you might get to stop and have your picture with any of these various Hemingway men in downtown and then uh barrelback walloon lake inn are doing featured cocktails and menu items every month throughout the whole year that are from the hemingway books that are about his recipes and his cocktails the hotel has a fly fishing package um, with a local fly guide named cause we kim and i went out yesterday with him on the jordan river so it's just a whole year of celebrating hemingway this hemingway homecoming and it was kind of interesting as I was doing early research, right after he was here in 47, there was letters to the editor in the Petoskey News of a local person going, why don't we have a Hemingway homecoming celebrating Hemingway? And this was after we had already named our event. And uh, I think one of the sisters replied back to that letter and said, well, he really doesn't come back here anymore. But, you know, I'm sure he appreciates, you know, the love everyone has for him here. Uh, so it's just, this is going to be our first year of doing this, and we hope to have many other events in the coming years that can make this a, what I want it to be is an active versus passive Hemingway destination in Michigan. We want writers to come back here. We want people to be inspired to, to paint as Grace did or to celebrate other arts and and get people here to read and write and create and create this beautiful space because you know you look at all the places with Hemingway all over the world and you ask people anywhere tell me a place that that Hemingway was and they'll tell you Paris and they'll tell you Key West and they'll tell you Oak Park and and Ketchum and they'll tell you Spain no, very rarely does somebody tell you northern Michigan or Walloon Lake yet those of us that were on the tour this morning and the tours we're going to see today, how many places have that many sites? And for so much, for so long, over two decades. Yes. Uh, he's connected here since the start. I mean, this was his first destination outside of home. And the influence it, would have, it, would have, it, it did play on his writing, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, the things you think of him, the good things <laughs> associated with Hemingway, but the love of water. He, he'll live around water his whole life. He will fish his whole life. He will hunt. He will write. I mean, all of those traits that he learned that became the man we know started here. And outside, you know, this is the first place he came to in Walloon Lake before he ever got to his cottage. He got off the train here. This is where it started. And that sense of adventure. I mean, those 
day trips that he's taking here at the age of 12, 13, 14, and then overnight trips by the time he's 14, 15, 16. I mean, he's going into some pretty harsh environments, but you really better know what you're doing. Right. Uh, he's a very happy with him, no doubt. And uh, with that sense of adventure, I, I mean, it, it absolutely, these were some of his biggest adventures here. And how many would think that a 16-year-old would get on, a, get on a boat in Chicago by himself with a friend? and come all the way up to Frankfurt and then hike from Frankfurt to Kalkaska on their own and then hike here, then hike over here. from here from on his own so you, it's just it's just amazing you know to think of all of the adventures that we don't know that he had what parent right now would let their child jump on a train yeah. <laughs> right i mean it's like we had those pictures of him jumping on and off the moving trains and, yeah uh, the back of the battery the encounters these punch drunk boxers you run into on old rail grades, at the jumping trains, those, those aren't your, usually your most, uh, <laughs> <laughs> most uh, first choice of uh, uh, All right, so we're going to head back to our cars and line up. We're going to head from here into downtown Boyne City and then off to some.